which way round it goes, I haven't a clue. Read the book. In January 1948, two young airmen, Jack Hemmings and Stuart King, set off on an epic flight to Africa. Here we go, life jackets. Little did they know that the film they shot of their adventure would prove to be a historical document. Well, we never thought when we took the film that we'd be showing it 71 or 2, 73 <laughs> years later and people would still be interested. Nor did they know that their expedition, the first flight of the Mission Aviation Fellowship, would sow the seeds of a large international organisation. MAF today is a wonderful global organisation. You know, I'm amazed to see what God has done. It's beyond belief, humanly speaking. Their original flight was a survey to find out whether light aircraft could help with missionary work. More than 70 years later, MAF works in 26 countries and carries 160,000 people a year, helping with medical emergencies, disaster relief, as well as spreading the gospel. It all started during the Second World War with a small article in a Christian magazine. You, you never saw this, Jack, but this is a letter uh, we found from my mum in 1945, September. I first heard about MAF while I was in the, still in the Air Force, and uh, at that stage, it was 1945, we were up in northern Germany, and I was sent a cutting uh, by my mother, actually, of someone who had written an article about the idea of using planes for peace instead of for war, for bringing life and hope instead of death and destruction. So that was this, this article, this Christian Airways service. Right. My connection came when I was out in India um, and an airman on the station came up to me one day and said, you might be interested in this. And it was a copy of the, the Mild May magazine. And they had just a little paragraph at the bottom saying that uh, a chap called Murray Kendon was talking about uh, um, launching some sort of a Christian air arm, as it were. And um, um, that was all it said. So um, when, when I got back to the UK, I went along to MAF and uh, said, uh, tell me all about it. Murray Kendon was the person who had come up with this idea, first of all. He was a New Zealand pilot flying with Coastal Command in the RAF during the war. He reckons that while spending these hours over the grey water of the Atlantic, he formed the vision of uh, uh, using aeroplanes for good rather than uh, to destroy. And he saw the opportunity if small planes could be used to reach into distant, remote, inaccessible places, uh, that this could be a blessing to thousands upon thousands. Today, the idea of using light aircraft to reach people in remote places is central to the ethos of MAF. But in 1947, it was an untested idea. Nobody knew if it was feasible or if there was a genuine need for a flying mission. There was only one way to find out. And so we uh, decided we needed to actually go out to Africa and see for ourselves. And the only way for that to really be practical and effective was to take a plane ourselves and to fly into some of these areas, see what the needs and problems were and then decide and be able to compare how the use of the plane might affect the outreach of these people into remote and difficult areas. Yes, this was the, uh, uh, the album. So a small team was put together to fly to Africa. Egypt, yeah. going through. Yeah. And conduct MAF's first ever survey. Yeah. 
I do so remember that. Uh, Eritrea, where we had that forced landing. Yeah. And then finally, Nairobi. Three of us were going to go. Uh, Jack Hemmings was the next Air Force squadron leader. He was going to be uh, our chief pilot. Stuart, of course, was the engineer, and he had also acquired a pilot's license, so he did a bit of the flying as well. Tom Bannum was an ex-Navy uh, air navigator. He was going to go and make sure we found the places we needed to. That's well, right. There's a picture of Tom, in, Tom the office, in the yeah. office. There was so much baggage and stuff to take out that Tom Bannum went out by boat and did all the planning out there. So when Stuart and I arrived, he'd got the whole of the tour mapped out. The idea of flying a small plane all the way to Africa may sound daunting, but to pilots who'd only recently been at war, it was nothing to worry about. During the war, you just did what you had to do. You didn't ask questions. I think I felt that um, here's a decent, chunky task to get your teeth into. Yeah. And, uh, I think we were crazy. <laughs> totally crazy. The first flight of MAF very nearly didn't happen at all. The day came for us to leave, 13th of January, 1948, uh, and we were at Croydon with the plane ready to go. On the very morning of leaving Croydon, I remember being very flustered because the weather was, was bad. It was pouring with rain, absolutely drenching, and a 60 mile an hour gale was blowing. Looking at it from today's point of view, I wouldn't have gone, but um, we'd got a party there to see us off and uh, um, other people were expecting us, so we went. Ahead of them lay a journey of more than 4,000 miles through nearly a dozen countries. The planned route was to fly originally from Croydon uh, across to Paris and press on. Uh, we, we planned it just by looking at the map and um, from the range of the aeroplane and where we could get fuel, we mapped out a route where we could uh, arrive in Nairobi. There wasn't really a rigid time scale, we just got there in, in good time. France. That first day, they made it to Paris. The following uh, morning, we flew further south, down uh, through France, southwards, uh, all the way to Marseille. The following day, we crossed the Mediterranean to Corsica. And then from Corsica, uh, we went down over Sardinia to Tunis in the North African coast. Our first view of uh, Africa, exciting. And we landed at Tunis We'd been having some engine trouble across the water. Uh, I was able to fix that, praise God. And then along the North African coast, following the route of all the fighting in World War II, the Desert Rats and Rommel and, and uh, Montgomery fighting each other fiercely. And then finally we arrived at Cairo. We got caught at Cairo some days because of radio trouble. Uh, we flew south, a uh, lot down the White Nile, and then carried on further south, finally across the border into Sudan at Wadi Halfa, one of the hottest places on earth. Uh, from Wadi Halfa, we were heading right across the sandy desert, nothing but sand. Sand, 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 everywhere you looked. Crossing the featureless desert would prove to be a challenge, even for veterans of hundreds of wartime flights. In those days we had no, no navigational aids at all, apart from a compass and a map. 
At one stage, I said to Jack, what use are our maps? They don't show us anything. We might as well have just a sheet of sandpaper. One day as they left Egypt, heading for the Sudan, the featureless terrain left them hopelessly lost. Relief data are incomplete. And so we said, well, we don't know where we are, we'd better get some help. So I tapped out an SOS, you see. You tap it out and you listen on the earphones for an instant response. Absolutely nothing. <laughs> we fortunately were able to finally spot a thin little line of railway that Lord Kitchener had uh, built when he was going to relieve the siege of Khartoum. So we finally came into Khartoum uh, and landed there. One of the mission leaders we met was Howard Borles, who was the director of the Sudan Interior Mission in, in the Sudan itself, and he was telling us of the tremendous needs. We got the maps out and asked him to show us what the needs were. And uh, this was our first contact with real on-the-field missionaries. And um, so we stayed there for quite a while in Khartoum and uh, learnt a lot from him and um, what he saw were the needs. The area he was interested was in the south, which is a vast swamp, the largest swamp in the world. And there was an area there about half the size of the whole of UK in which his missionaries worked and they were tremendously cut off. You could reach them with three hard days of travel, very hard days. In the wet season, they could be cut off for up to nine months of a time because the roads became absolutely impassable. And Howard Borlitz said, can't you come and uh, set up a service for us here? So we noted that need, but then we had to get on to our destination in Nairobi, uh, what, 1,200 miles further south. Once again, the vast terrain, lacking in any distinct features, nearly caught them out. One time when we did really get into a bit of trouble was between Malacca, which is South Sudan, and Juba, which is now the capital of South Sudan. Um, and the area in between, on the map, it was just swamp. So there's no, 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 no guiding features at all, but if you steer a straight, straight course across, you come across to the Nile, which is looped round. The Nile, of course, was the landmark. But when it got to the bit, According to our navigation, when you should be able to see the Nile, no Nile in sight. We soldiered on, it's still over swamp, still over swamp, the sun still was over setting. swamp. The sun was setting. The fuel <laughs> needle of the fuel was getting lower yeah, fuel and lower, lower yeah. yes. So it was really quite hairy. <laughs> so you, you are saying to yourself, what's going to happen now? Uh, and then the Nile turned up, you see. Yeah, just as the sun was setting, yeah. I caught a glimpse of something orange uh, glinting. I think I said to you, Jack, there's water there. There's, <laughs> there's the river. And we finally kind of crept in to Juba as the sun was setting. Uh, the next day we headed across leaving Sudan and heading across Uganda. It was just wonderful to see the fertile country in the fields. Civilization at last, <laughs> we cried. And finally, I think it was after 26 days, we arrived at Nairobi. After thousands of miles and nearly a month of flying, their adventures were only just beginning. From their base in Nairobi, Jack and Stuart began a series of flights and journeys that would take them around Central Africa in three great loops, taking in the Belgian Congo, isolated parts of Kenya and French Equatorial Africa, and finally Rwanda, Burundi and Tanganyika. Their journeys would take them six months, 
meeting mission groups and missionaries to explore whether an aircraft would help in their work. Murray Kendon had drawn up a questionnaire, about a four or six page questionnaire. He and Tom Bannum had arranged for us to visit about a hundred different mission stations throughout Central Africa. And at every one of those, we sat people down and we filled in this questionnaire. And it would ask a lot of major questions. One, what were the areas they couldn't reach? Did they go out into villages? Would a plane reach them? Did they have plans for hospitals or anything like that? Would we be able to build airstrips or clear airstrips? Would the government allow us to do it? All the time they're talking and explaining what their aims and objectives are, we're thinking, uh, is there a place there for aeroplanes? Uh, in other words, we were trying to get an accurate, realistic, down-to-earth, objective picture uh, of their needs. As well as spending time with missionaries and their families, Jack and Stuart were able to meet local people too. Everywhere we landed, of course, was somewhere new to us, and a lot of the places uh, hadn't seen aeroplanes for months, if not years. <laughs> the Africans, of course, who would, maybe a lot of them would never have seen an aeroplane even in the, air, in the air, to suddenly have a an aeroplane standing beside their village, you know, total bewilderment. One of the places as we proceeded across Congo further was right in central Congo and uh, a doctor there had asked us uh, if we could come and visit his place. He said, I'll make you an airstrip and you can come and land there. And he'd actually pulled out thousands of trees out of the forest there and cleared an airstrip there. We came down, touched down okay, came to a rather abrupt halt and found our wheels had sunk into the soft airstrip where all these trees had been pulled out uh, and were up to the axle there, but we didn't turn over. I suppose it announced that the aeroplane was coming to this strip, but they had all been preparing for, for months. So there was um, a big reception committee and um, people gathered round with great interest. And one chief came along and he was a smile, he was actually a Christian. Uh, I think he was the only Christian chief there. He was smiling away and I noticed some of his teeth were missing in the front. And apparently the custom in that area was that if something special happened, some notable event, you removed a tooth. So we wondered if he was gonna uh, lose another tooth because of our landing. One of the other purposes of the survey was to establish whether there would be suitable places to land a plane. At pretty well every station uh, where we thought there was a possibility of using aeroplanes, the question was where are you going to land an aeroplane? And uh, of course Africa is big and lots of empty spaces and uh, we, it wasn't difficult in many, in many cases it wasn't difficult to find a bit of flat ground, but occasionally you came across areas where the grass was above your head height. In Burundi particularly, I remember the elephant grass, which was way above your heads. And that made it rather hard to determine if a certain area beneath you was suitable for an airstrip. So one of the things I developed was to use a long piece of string and Jack would go at one end and I would go at the other end and try to work out how much the slope was. Uh, that was an interesting bit of um, civil engineering. <laughs> In 
in some locations it was impossible to land their plane without further investigation, so Jack and Stuart had to take to the road. The uh, challenges of travel were quite varied. A lot of places we couldn't actually fly right to the place we want to. Sometimes I remember getting on some of the Kenya trains and travelling for hours by train. Occasionally we would get a missionary come out and take us around, either from where we had landed and he would take us into other mission areas or come from those areas if he was interested in us coming to his airstrip. And of course you saw all forms of travel. Uh, getting stuck in the mud of sliding, slithering all over the place. Of uh, radiators boiling away, of uh, radiator hose pipes bursting and uh, many kind of situations uh, like that. In the Congo, Jack and Stuart had one of their most memorable encounters. At one part of the Congo we came across the pygmies. They were cheerful chaps, they laughed at us really because we were so absurd looking. <laughs> This stupid colour skin and you know, what you're doing up there in the world, over five feet high. <laughs> and that was fascinating because here were these tiny people living in great tall, under enormously tall uh, forest trees. And the contrast was amazing. We looked into their huts and sort of chatted to them, you know how you can chat in a way without understanding a single word. They were showing us their bows and arrows. They actually would tackle shooting an elephant with, with arrows and they, could, they would actually bring an elephant uh, down. After several weeks travel, dozens of tricky takeoffs and landings, disaster struck shortly after they took off from Burundi on their final flight back to their base at Nairobi. So we were climbing cautiously up uh, over the Burundi mountains. But as we went further up the valley, we found that our rate of climb was dropping off considerably. Jack said, something's wrong. We stopped climbing entirely and we're in fact going down. The rate of climb needle dipped down and we were going down at 350 feet a minute. Before we could do much about it, we'd been sort of caught in these down drafts that would, uh, although we got full throttle and doing all we could to go up, um, we were going down. We hit a banana tree. And I looked out at the starboard wing, the right wing, and saw we'd lost a few feet of it. And then we went sort of uh, splat into the side of the hillside. Cloud of dust blew up and we slid down the mountainside and came to a halt, the plane breaking up around us as we went. Their plane had slammed into a mountain ridge leaving them in the wreckage, a hundred miles from where they'd taken off. And um, we just opened the door and climbed out, and uh, <laughs> neither of us was um, hurt other than a bit of a scratch, I think. <laughs> but the aeroplane was um, total write-off. The main spar was broken. In fact, one wing was under the aeroplane. There were two wings on one side. All our work for two years, getting the plane, being able to buy it, getting the funds, and all the work we'd done was matchwood beside us on the mountainside. 
but drawing on their wartime training and their faith, the pair struggled back to Nairobi. Somehow I think God gave us the grace to accept what had happened and to press on. To press on was rather difficult. It took us days and days to get back to Nairobi. With no plane but determined to complete their mission, Jack and Stuart took to the roads. God also gave us the grace to carry on and uh, we bought a Ford station wagon and did the rest of the survey of Tanzania by land. After completing their African survey by road, Jack and Stuart returned to England to submit their findings. And at first, it didn't look like there was a future for mission aviation. We went back to UK. Our council was rather doubtful about us going back, back again. The insurers were also made quite a fuss about uh, giving us a, any uh, recompense for the plane. They also had to convince the Mildmay Foundation, who provided the funds not only for the crash Gemini, but for the survey too. I understand that our report was received somewhat coolly at Mildmay, where they're expecting to uh, make a lot of it. And we had said, well, you know, quite a lot of places in Africa, they've got things pretty well organized. At that time, many of the missions they'd visited had well organized transport and didn't see the need for aeroplanes to help their work. And they've got their roads and their rivers and uh, they've built their hospitals and schools and uh, churches and people can get around all right. But um, we did highlight the needs of the Sudan. Their survey had established that the vast marshes of the south would make plains an invaluable aid. And that's what we proposed to the council. They weren't at all keen on that. I remember at a council meeting, Jack and I all sitting around with these uh, venerable council members, most of them white-haired or grey-haired, uh, and them saying, well, if we let you go there, you'll just come back again with your tail between your legs. It's not going to work, is it? However, the chairman, who was uh, a wonderful Christian man, said, well, I think if these young men feel they should go, we should let them go. And strangely enough, no one argued after that and they let us go. When the insurance company paid out for their crash Gemini, MAF were able to buy a new, larger aircraft suited to the needs of the country. We bought a, had to buy a rather old-fashioned plane. A de Havilland Rapide, a twin-engined, ten-seater uh, aircraft. South Sudan became MAF's first major operation and was a successful demonstration of using planes to facilitate mission work. We were able to open up the whole of the South and enable missionaries to get into areas they couldn't otherwise do uh, uh, access or stay safely. So we saw some wonderful things happen. Meanwhile, the vision for using aeroplanes to support mission work had been developing in other continents. In Latin America, Africa, Asia, missionaries labored without supply lines and without any regular contact with the outside world. In South America, planes were helping to reach deep into the Amazon jungle. Whole groups of primitive people have been discovered who without the airplane would never have been found. But South America was to be the location of a bloody tragedy that shocked the world of missionary aviation. In 1956, I was in Khartoum and we first got news of the death of Nate Saint, one of our early pilots. Nate Saint flew with MAF America. He and four colleagues were working in South America 
to contact remote tribes. My grandfather, Nate Sain, was a missionary pilot with MAF in the jungles of Ecuador, serving the missionaries who were working out in the Amazon. Along with his wife and young children, Nate was working to support missionaries. His role was to provide them with supplies and medicine, whatever they needed so that they could reach the tribes that they were working with. In September 1955, Nate took off for a series of flights over the Ecuadorian jungle, trying to locate the hidden villages of an uncontacted tribe with a fearsome reputation. He was hoping to use his plane to drop gifts. One of the reasons why he's been important to MEF worldwide is that back in the 1950s, he worked with four other missionaries from other organizations to reach a tribe of people in the Ecuadorian jungle. From the air, Nate eventually located a settlement of the Waudauni tribe, and he and his colleagues were determined to establish communication. They flew mission after mission, lowering gifts from their plane. For 13 weeks at the end of 1955, my grandfather had made contact from the airplane with a tribe of Indians, the Waudani Indians, then known as the Alcas, who were a very violent tribe. Despite their reputation, Nate and his colleagues decided to land their plane. He, um, he, he took them into, the, into a location very close to where these people lived. In a daring maneuver, Nate landed on the only available surface. Landed on a river bank and over a period of four or five days they made contact with these people. Out of the jungles came three Waodani people. They had a friendly contact there on the beach, and my grandfather, along with his friends, knew that God was going to write a story that included them sharing the gospel with these Indians. On January 8th, 1956, out of the jungles came the Waodani tribe, not for a friendly contact. In fact, they speared my grandfather and his four friends to death. time, it seemed like it was a huge tragedy that these, these five young men in their twenties had all been killed. What a waste of life. And yet out of that has come an amazing response worldwide to mission. The death of these five missionaries caused a great surge of other people to want to become missionaries. I think some 500 uh, became missionaries in the following few years, including Max Gove, one of our pilots who's been with us over 40 years. Books were written about these five young men and the one about Nate Saint was called Jungle Pilot. I got hold of that book when I was 14 and through that God really spoke to me and showed me that this was something that I could do, that I could, I could be a missionary pilot with MAF. People around the world, including a lot of pilots, are inspired by my grandfather because they hear that he was willing to give his life for the sake of the gospel, to reach a group of unreached people in a remote area. One of the interesting facts is that more than 50% of all the pilots who've ever joined MEF have come in because of Nate Saint's story in Jungle Pilot and he's, through his death he inspired many, many other people to come into this kind of work. The legacy of my grandfather along with Jim, Roger, Ed and Pete is simply about obedience. It was not that they were anything other than common, ordinary men who were willing to let God write their story His way, not their way. They were simply obedient to follow the, the story that He was writing for them. Meanwhile, the vision for using aeroplanes to support mission work had been developing in other countries too. We also flew from Sudan, started flying into Ethiopia, across the border. After Ethiopia, 
We opened up work in East Africa, Kenya, Tanzania, and then later in 1965, I did a survey of Chad at the request of missionaries there. And we opened up a program the following year with an amphibious plane working around Lake Chad and uh, along the rivers. As the reach expanded, they added new facilities, with hangars being built to protect the aircraft from African weather. Throughout the 70s and 80s, uh, our main focus was in Africa. It broadened out after that uh, much wider indeed. As the organisation grew from its small roots in the 50s to encompass more countries in the 60s and 70s, more pilots and support staff began to arrive many bringing families with them. One of those pilots was Max Gove, who witnessed the growth that the 70s and 80s brought to MAF. When we joined MAF at the beginning of the 70s, it was quite a small organisation. And I suppose the interesting thing for us was that we knew all the families in our part of MAF. And uh, it, it was sort of like a big family. As the 70s continued though, we started getting people from other countries joining the organisation. The 70s and 80s also saw MAF continuing to help aid agencies deal with natural disasters and conflicts, and it became a period of expansion across the globe. I would say that MAF grew the fastest in, from around the mid-1980s. That's when a lot of new countries were opened, Madagascar being the first one, and then so on right throughout Africa and then to other parts of the world as well. Now MAF has grown further and faster than its early pioneers could ever have imagined. <laughs> People often ask me, did I realise how much MAF would grow in later years? And uh, I always give them the same answer. No, we were too busy getting on with what was on our plate then. Now, 70 years after their historic flight, Stuart and Jack can look back with satisfaction on what they achieved as young men. From our survey, big things grew. <laughs> MAF is now a global organisation. Seventy years after it was founded, MAF remains driven by the same passion that inspired its early pioneers. Our motivation is to show the love of God uh, in action and in practical ways. We work in places where there is long-term need. Today, MAF operates in over 26 developing countries, from Africa to South America and into Asia and the Pacific. We really work in partnership with other organisations. Um, we're the way to get them there. Uh, and many of the people we fly are household names, Tear Fund, World Vision, um, Save the Children, and so many people that, that uh, people would have heard of in this country. But we also fly a lot of organisations that are specific to the, to the country we, we live and operate in, and uh, smaller organisations that are there to, to help and to bring vital services to the people there. In remote terrain, a short flight can replace days of travel by jeep, saving vital time for MAF staff and partners. Ground trip would be very hard and very long for them, so we do fly for them, so they we enables them to have a short visits, field trips, and see the different peoples around there and take care of their job. MAF planes mean that groups such as Reaching the Light can make the most of their time on the ground. So flying them is really makes them, you know, to spend more time with the kids and train the parents and see the parents. So flying for them is an advantage. <laughs> One of the greatest changes over the last few decades has been in the type of staff that MAF recruits. 
maybe in the 1950s, if we look at the photographs, we're often flying the white missionary into the African jungle, and now we are flying uh, national groups, we're flying Africans to help Africans. Uh, so uh, some of the people that we fly, the doctors, the nurses, the pastors, evangelists, some of the people have changed. But the thing that I, I notice is they have a real heart for people and they want to see lives change, they want to make a difference and that's very much a common theme. That's just as true for ground staff as pilots. MF is involved in flying, but I would say we don't just fly. We fly for a purpose, we fly for life. Every day that I wake up to report to work, I know that uh, in one way or another, I'm contributing to the spread of the gospel. I may not be a preacher, but I think being able to facilitate a pastor to his remote church. I may not be a doctor, but knowing that I'm able to facilitate a doctor in a remote clinic to be able to receive equipment and medicine, um, contributing in one way or another to their well-being. MAF can look back on long relationships with countries such as South Sudan, Kenya and Papua New Guinea. MAF has operated in Papua New Guinea since 1951 uh, and it's another example of a place that we continue to be really very much needed. We'll transport building supplies, for example, for rural health centres, for rural schools, take missionaries into various communities where access is just very, very restricted. Uh, we've got a number of rural hospitals that we help support, so we'll bring medevac patients in and then fly the patients home after they're recovered. So from a nation's point of view, MAF has probably impacted Papua New Guinea as a nation more than any other programme. I think in the early days of MAF, many believed that uh, one day we wouldn't be needed in the developing world. Um, infrastructure would be built and isolation and inaccessibility would cease to be a problem. But today we live not only in a world without development, but in a broken world. In many parts of the world, the needs are even greater than when MAF started. And how much is the love of God needed in these places in word and deed? And so we will continue flying for life.